Welcome back to another drama-filled episode of Digging Ditches. I am your host, Stephen Winsett. And today, wow, we've got a doozy for you. You have got to listen to Roy Runyon and digs his own ditch and falls into it. It is just uh, another example of the kettle calling the pot black. Um, wow, folks, you got to listen. Hey, I'm your host, Stephen Winston. Glad you could join us and uh, have a listen. Okay, getting into things here. Um, I'm going to be, what I'm going, I'm working on right now is this is developing a podcast alongside a YouTube video. We're doing them both at the same time. That way you can go actually to the YouTube video and, and see the pictures and see what I'm going to be bringing up. And then, of course, you guys can uh, and then hear it like on the radio and then look at it at a different time. But the pictures will be there and the pictures are going to be important. They are very important um, for, well, for you to understand the context of, of these spirit and lectures, uh, things that he calls a joke and humor, which I, I sadly disagree with. Um, enthusiastically disagree with I don't know how I, you know but all I know is what they put forth here is, is false spirit and death lectures that's the, the only way I can describe what I've heard um, let me start then by putting out this is the how Roy ended his old lecture series and uh, you, you gotta hear this you just gotta hear this is how he ends it all uh, errors Distractors have spent decades honing their skills at how to dismantle what the Bible says and how to obfuscate, cloud and confuse, which is the exact opposite of what Paul said to let all things be done in edification. So you see, everybody who opposes full program is obfuscating. We're uneducated, we're ignorant, we're stupid. We've been holding our skills to twist and, and pervert the word of God for 20 years because we are all as dishonest as 3D, you, you know, it's a $3 bill. And uh, that's his accusation against every single one of us, everybody. This, I, I wow, every leader of the church for, for 2,000 years, that's all we've done is hold our skills to uh, hmm, twist the scriptures. And that, my friend, is called arrogance because they think they have the right one. Therefore, and you got to remember that full pregnant was only invented. This idea of the second coming happened in 78. It's, only, it's a recent invention. Um, it happened just during the 60s, 70s, I think 70s mostly, with Max Keating and his developing of his stuff. Um, I got his book here somewhere. Um, uh, it's somewhere around here. House Divided, Middleism, Oh, End Times, Creation According to Jesus, Pastor Jack, Post Millennialism. Yeah, I've got the book here. I know it's around here somewhere. <laughs> I, I got books stacked up all over the place. But the idea is, is that um, Max King, he, he's the one who put that out there to begin with and uh, wanted to tell everybody that Jesus came in WD and then tries to prove it and then he's unable to do it. Uh, so he's, you know, developed transmillennialism to explain now universalism. Uh, but yet we're the dumb ones. Okay. They let all things be done in obfuscation. And they, and they dismount what, what the scriptures say, say that's as simple as a red prayer, and they reassemble it into something totally different. different. <laughs> now he's showing pictures. And again, I use a little humor here, and not necessarily any one person. They are very But I am using these spaces and not give us all because to represent a um, group or genre of people. And this particular genre of people know exactly what they're doing. That's why they have threatened their members to not attend our seminars or lectures because they might learn something. When you got false teaching, what did Paul say? Shun those people who teach false teachings. Put them out. Don't put up with them. Do not have anything to do with the Nicolaitans. They're teaching you false doctrine. Don't have anything to do with them. And Roy, you should know that. 
and they know, know, they know exactly what this is the fear that is instilled. Is that what Paul said? Is that you're supposed to fear these people who teach false teachings and doctrines and demons? No, it's not fear. We're not afraid. And that's another false accusation that we're afraid. This is how they try to muddy the waters and make us all look bad. We're futurists. But mostly they're speaking to themselves and their own audience and trying to boost their own egos. I, I you know. Mm. Well, these mean, and then and there's, there's another genre, genre of people. people. Well, again, this, this, is, a, this, this is the same, same genre, genre of people, people here. That, again, they know exactly, exactly what they're doing. Do. And this, this is the other genre. genre. <laughs> again, he's showing a derogatory type of thing. They literally don't, don't know, know that they, they can't, can't count, count to one, one when it comes to this topic. Yeah. And, and this, this is what we're dealing with. with. These are did you hear that? They don't know what they're dealing with with eschatology, but they do. See the arrogance in that? And then you got the person, yes, yes, that's true. Um, wow, people. Let's let's go on. This, uh, <laughs> this, this is what God is saying. saying. And he's got him uh, his face plastered onto a, a Nazi. And you tell me this is called humor. That's what he's trying to tell me is this is this is humorous. This is totally humorous. And I'm sorry, Roy, I don't find that humorous at all. Can't blame it. But again, it's a little humor. And it's, you know, it's, it's not, not really the aspect of being called names. It is the ignorance of the people. Of the people. Of the people. It is the arrogance from which it emanates. That we're is the dead. Sick. That's right. We're the arrogant ones. Right, right. And you have, you have the know, truth and we they don't. don't know. They uh, don't know. Because it's it's all. All. They don't know anything about it. It's good. We but, do. Uh, this, this is the problem. problem. And this, this, is, this, is, this is the problem that we face. We have to combat. And you see, we don't have to call people names. But you do. Because we've got the truth. And the reason we are called names is because we have the truth. And because they can't answer our questions. questions. And that's why they hide in the shadows, most of them. And they attack us in private. And they won't come out into the public and debate us publicly before an audience. Because they know they can't answer our arguments. And if that is exposed to a public audience, there'd be somebody there that would see that. They would realize we got the truth. Okay, yeah, thank you so much for your comment. Okay, that concludes it. Now, let me show you something. He says truth and we're hiding in the shadows. I've had a web page up uh, for quite a while now. And uh, it's Elisha's Bones. But I did a debate with Michael Miano. And I'm proud of that debate. It was my first one. I did not go after him. I was not mean, spirited, anything at all. I was very gentle with him. But he, he goes on here on this. Uh, this is Michael Miano's website and uh, uh, advertising there. Power of Preterism. This is his, and he reviews the, the classes and the things like this. And uh, let's, oops, went back too far down. Yeah, here's what he does. I love how Roy Runney includes humor in regards to the false teachers of futurism and their constant subterfuge. I've never been used subterfuge, change meaning of words, and all the things that they accuse me of doing. In fact, I will show you just the opposite in these next videos. Um, and they're calling us false teachers. Well, when you say that the resurrection and the second coming happened in 70 AD and you've got no historical collaboration, what are we supposed to do? That's a false. I, I mean, we're teaching that Jesus is going to come again. You're teaching he came. Okay, show us the evidence from history. They can't do it. They said, well, you just have to believe Jesus. You don't look at the false church and the false people and those early church fathers. They all lied. They were in apostasy. They did this, that, they did that. You can't believe anything that they said. And, oh, Jesus said, I'm going to build my church for 2,000 years. And, and, of course, right after, right by the time we get to 70 AD, he completely blew it. And and that was the end of the end of that. So, let me, well, let me show you. This is my website. Or this is uh, the Michael Mann's power, you know. His thing that I was just showing you, talking about. 
And for those that are on the podcast, I know you can't see, but if you go to the YouTube video, you'll be able to see it. So he and I went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Um, and I, uh, I hope I, I'll be able to cue it up okay in the right place, but uh, uh, we're going to be going back to that and looking at something a little bit later, and it's going to point a finger. Now, as far as hiding in the, in the dark, I've had this web page up now since 2021, but I've actually had it up much longer than that. But here at the beginning of the year, I put in a challenge um, to any three of you guys, Steve Basin, Holger, John, anybody, Roy, any of you guys want to do a formal debate, it's been out there. I have been told totally time and thing, I'm not worth it. Roy Runyon tells me I'm not worth it. And I've told them over and over again, then me and Sam will both come. Don't you think Sam's worth it? Come on, let's do it. But they want to do it. Why is it that none of them will accept the challenge? Why is it John Watson won't accept the challenge and instead chooses to block me as Roy has done completely? They've blocked me from anything being able to see it, but they can't hide from YouTube. So I've been putting things there and, and then I did change my name. You know, I'm one of those and got to listen to this last Tuesday night and produce a few videos. But explain to me, it's here, it's out here, we're waiting, we're looking for it, just tell us when. And so when Roy says that we're hiding in the dark and everything else, you know that's a flat out lie because it's right here. It's been here for over a year, since January 1st of 2021. I have screamed bloody murder for it and, and they won't do it. So you've got an example of my debate and my supposedly wrangling of words uh it's right there for you to take a look at and so what we're going to do is we're going to look at today we're going to deal with roy runyon um and his teaching in there and it's going to start with i believe um talking about the paris uh, the second coming and then the parousia so we're going to go I think right here in the video, and you'll be able to see of Daniel 7 or Daniel 12. Now we can, it's fun, it's interesting, it's a good study, but I don't have to. Why? Because Jesus quotes Daniel 7 in Matthew 24, 30 and 31, and then he says, Verily I say unto you, this generation, there's that time indicator, this generation will not pass till all of these things be fulfilled. But which generation is he talking about? Well, it would be the generation that would see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. And it would be the generation that when they would see that abomination, those in Judea would flee to the mountains. Okay, now from the very beginning, any time that I've talked with Roy and we've had some major discussions, I have said it from the beginning. I don't know how else to explain it or anything, express it or anything. I do not, uh, I hate that word, play and twist scriptures this generation means this generation. I believe all of the Olivet was fulfilled in 70 AD. Do you get that, Roy? Other full preterists, based and whoever wants to listen to this, understand that. I have always taught the 70 AD was the fulfillment of all of the Olivet. Therefore, Roy, and you can hear the videos, twists it back and says, well, then, then that was the second coming. No, it wasn't the second coming. Now, let me explain to you why it wasn't the second coming. It's because the language of Son of Man coming on clouds is not about Jesus coming down. Okay, um, I'm going to kind of reverse order a little bit of what I was going to do. And, well, no, I should just continue playing with it in him and just expose him first. Okay, let's go on. It is right about here, I think. Yeah, we're going to go into his full thing on this. They would see the abomination of desolation, Jerusalem surrounded by armies. They would experience the great tribulation. They would see Jerusalem trodden underfoot by the Gentiles for 42 months. They would see the Jewish temple completely dismantled. It'd be the generation that would see the apostles killed. They'd be the generation that would see the day of redemption. And to be the generation that would see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. Now, was that Pentecost? No. I challenge any man anywhere. To 
Okay, I wanted to point that out. Coming in his kingdom. Remember that appointment. He is coming in his kingdom. Show me the scripture that says the kingdom would or did come on Pentecost. Futurists, there's your challenge. Now look at here. We're familiar. I've never argued that, so that's he's going to be responding to other false teachers besides me. Ha <laughs> ha. I said it in cheek. But no, I've never ever claimed or said that the uh, uh, it didn't happen in that generation and that he did not come into his kingdom at, and or came into his kingdom in Pentecost. Here with this, and let's look at this. Jesus cites Daniel 7 in Matthew 16, 27 and 28. The Son of Man is about to come, mellow in the present tense, with his angels, glory the Father, he will give reward to each according to their practice. Now we're familiar with the parallels, Mark 8 and Luke 9. Here's what I want you to notice. The phrases in the brown, see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom, is synonymous with seeing the kingdom of God come with power, is synonymous with see the kingdom of God. Those phrases are synonymous because this is the same conversation recorded by three writers. Why is it different? Well, Matthew is teaching and, and has written to Jews. Mark was written to people kind of um, in general to Jews and Gentiles later on in the church. Uh, so it was kind of more of a generic. Uh, you would almost say the ten tribes type of people, people that were had been scattered and were not necessarily living in Jerusalem. So that was kind of his awesome. Luke, of course, was written strictly to Gentiles, uh, Greeks, people steeped in Greek literature. And so they wrote from a little bit of a different perspective in order to communicate better to his, their audience. So is this true? The Son of Man coming in his kingdom, see the kingdom of God come with power, and they will see the kingdom of God. Those are all uh, true in what he's saying there. They all are synonymous. Uh, they're just said a different way because of the different audience. And any argument that separates these two verses divorces the Son of Man from coming in His kingdom. Because the Son of Man coming in His kingdom is synonymous with the Son of Man coming in His glory. Now, I'm going to prove that. That's right. Now, futurists, you come up here close now. Turn your hearing aids up so you can see and hear what I'm about to show you. You remember the incident when James, John, and their mommy came to Jesus asking him for a favor. She said, Grant that these my two sons may sit the one on your right hand and the other on the left in your kingdom. Okay, you get this. They were asking that when you came into your kingdom, not here on earth, in heaven, I want to sit on your right and your left. Is it talking about in heaven? Yes. Does Roy point this out? No. But Mark records the same statement as sit on your right hand and on your left in your glory. You see that? Yes. You see that, futures? Amen. The Son of Man in His kingdom is synonymous with the Son of Man coming in His glory. The Olivet Discourse is Jesus foretelling the coming of the Son of Man in His kingdom. And we lose sight of that. And futures, it completely goes over their head because they are so focused on the destruction of Jerusalem. And, and it's it's funny that he says this. This is total, again, transference. You're showing a person who is steeped in transference because he's saying we're upset with 70 AD and we're not. Futures are not. Most futures don't care about 70 AD. They think all of the Olivet is much future. And then he brings up Darby or whatever else you want to bring up, you know. We don't care about that. In the, in the sense that he thinks and he said that they do. It's, it's totally, think about it. Darbyism, premillennial, all of those things put 90% of the Olivet into the future. And so it's never applied to 70 AD. So this is a, 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 a transference. It's a mind boggling thing that shows how twisted his thinking is. In fact, that's their very argument for when Jesus said, all things written will be fulfilled in about the fall of Jerusalem. They separate that and they insert their qualifier about the destruction of Jerusalem. No such thing. <laughs>
These are the days of vengeance. It's not a qualifier that we're sticking in there. We're sticking to the context. All of these things that are discussed in the Olivet are going to happen in that day. So why all prophecies written about these days of vengeance have to happen in those days, doesn't it not? All prophecies about the destruction of Jerusalem has to be fulfilled. What is the problem with that interpretation? We're not the ones saying that all prophecy, because we know all prophecy wasn't fulfilled in the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, the prophecies of John the Baptist, one calling in the witness, was that fulfilled? No. Uh, Isaiah 19, there's plenty of prophecies. Isaiah 65, 66, when was those things fulfilled? And it, it goes on and on. So, no, we've always understood that uh, uh, everything fulfilled about the Olivet is what was fulfilled in those days and has nothing to do with all prophecies period but all prophecies concerning the concerning the days of vengeance so the days of vengeance is the subject of that sentence of what is being all fulfilled but again that comes back to greek grammar roy doesn't know he he's not educated in greek or anything else he he pretends to be but he's and they completely missed the fact that jesus is foretelling the son of man coming in his kingdom because he's quoting from the only prophecy the son of man coming in the thoughts of heaven etc ushering in the everlasting kingdom. And again, Jesus quotes that in Matthew 24, 30 and 31. The Son of Man, all tribes of the earth will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He'll send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. Did you see that? What's back? Okay, I'm going to hold off on there because here's where I'm going to go to next. I've got to uh, change a view real quick so that you'll be able to... Uh, see this window capture i'm going to change it um, i want you to see this and speaker mail no okay i gotta bring this up first uh this is my uh this is my uh book that i wrote and there it is okay here's the book that i wrote um, the copy of it, it's called Full Presence of the Assault on Orthodox Christianity. I wrote this, and I think at the beginning of January, again, is when I finished this edition. Um, copyright, no, 2020. So I did this last year. Now, on page, I can go back to page 170. I want you to, um, I'm scrolling through the screen, of course. I can't make it much bigger, but uh, uh, you'll be able to. 170. And this is what I wrote. Let me adjust this so I can see it better. We talked about melon. And I got to go up to 170. Yeah, that was about 101 time statements. Now, where is it? Okay. Frost once taught the truth of covenant standards, but he just in church history and the creed he chose the worst of men over the word of God, which is not true. That's called a bold faced lie. And then uh, hmm. all of a sudden I'm missing something here. Okay. I'm looking for it. Oh, here it is. It's on page 177. So let's go down to 177. I thought I had it. I, I did and I did. So, um, page 177. Okay, here it is. I found it. It's on different on the, on the, on the thing here. Uh, another point to add is that John said, We shall see him as he is. The Olivet contains no language of a promise of personal coming, i.e. second appearing as described by the apostles. Dr. Jimmy Henry, 
whose book was written, Eyewitness of His Majesty, He is a Preterist. Don Preston published his book and puts it out there. He's a preterist who states in his book, Eyewitness of His Majesty, since LaHaye and I agree that Jesus quotes Daniel 7.13, analyzing what the passage actor says will be helpful. Notice that the coming of the Son of Man is up, not down. The destination is heaven, not earth. It is clear that Jesus is talking about his throne that took place when he ascended into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God, then took his place in AD 30. Uh, it was at this time that Jesus completed his mission and entered into heaven itself by his own blood. Do you get that? He's saying that Daniel 7 and 13 and 14 is about him ascending, not coming down um we'll get to that in, 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 in a second but i wanted to point that out this is something i talked about two years ago and now we're back to uh spirit and life lectures and so he's bringing this up about the son of man coming in clouds and he's talking about daniel 7 the only one that talks about it. so let's go to daniel 7 and i'm going to show you something where he he doesn't take the time to show you this. He says what? I saw the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days. So if the son of man is coming to the ancient of days. Where is the ancient of days? He's in heaven. So the son of man is coming to him and he was presented before him. And the him was given dominion and glory and kingdom. When did he come into his kingdom? And his kingdom once shall not be destroyed. When did he come in at his ascension? He ascended into the throne. He was seated at the right hand and he was given all power and authority and to rule until he makes all the enemies his footstool. Is that not true? You can't. So this whole time that Roy, you listen to him talking about this, he's not telling you that he came to the ancient of days in heaven, that this is enthronement, that... Uh, this is something that Don Preston agrees with. Other predators, David Henry, who wrote a book, a doctor. He, Roy's not a doctor. It's there for all people to see. I read about it in my book, The Full Preterism, the, uh, the Assault on Orthodox Christianity. It is there. I recorded it and, and so forth. Uh, let's go back to him just a little bit further. I think I got a little bit more I want to read. I have a look at it again. He shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. Now gather together his... Now look what he says next. He gives them the parable of the fig tree. And then he says, So likewise you, when you see all these things, know that it is near. What is it? It is a pronoun. It has to refer to an antecedent. What is it? Well, look at Luke's record. You got the Son of Man coming in the cloud. He gives them the parable of the fig tree. Now look what he says. So likewise you, when you see these things come to pass, know you that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Okay, so the kingdom of God, it was him sitting at the right hand of the Father. That's what Matthew 26 says, that he sat down at the right hand of the Father, and from there, clouds of judgment, he will send judgment. Um, there is more we got to, we're going to find a little bit later. But I want to take you back somewhere. Okay, I told you I've, I've been debating Roy back and forth. Well, here's, here's a video again. Now, I want you to look at this date. July 20th, 2019. Um, let me... Does that mean this is about talking about the, son of, uh, the coming of the Son of Man? I want to uh, point out something here. Uh, 2430. Let's look at this real quick. Now, this is the passage. Everybody says, yes, yeah, see, Son of Man... Coming on clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That's the second coming. Oh, wow. See, it says that he has come in that generation. All right. The son okay. of man. Now, let me get this. Let me give you this context real quick. Acts 1. He will come out of heaven from through the clouds to earth. That's the coming promised in Acts 1. What is the promise in Daniel 7 3? That he would ascend into heaven. So, when did he send? Acts 1. And coming on clouds with heaven and power. Where is Jesus quoting that from? Where does that, that thing, does it come from an Old Testament passage? 
Yeah. Let's let's look at the commentaries. These are people who, you know, wrote about those things. It doesn't mean they're right and everything. It just means what did they say? Well, and there was giving him dominion. I don't know, gills. Let me move forward a little bit. There he, he's quoting it. Uh, so all okay. the commentaries so agree. Most we can find that real quick. Let's let's look at this. The point of this is that I brought this up two years ago in, now, in 2019, and I've really talked about it, and I gave uh, this, this stuff to Roy. I'm, I'm this is the things that I argued with Roy about. So, he had all of this information. And to show you why Roy Runyon's thing there is, is a complete fallacy. Because basically he denied that it was a coming pain. going up. He denied it emphatically that that language is not about him going up. With the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. Uh-huh. Okay, see, I did it way back then. Now, this this spirit life lecture. Let me see if I make sure I get the right... Uh... He says in uh, Surprised by Hope, page 126, it says, Nor will it do to say, as do some who grasp part of the point, but have not worked it through, that the events of AD 70 were themselves the second coming of Jesus. So that ever since then we have been living in God's new age, and there is no further coming to await. This may seem to many readers, as indeed it seems to me, a bizarre position to hold. But there are some who not only hold it, but also eagerly propagate it and use some of my arguments to support it. This results from a confusion. Who, who in their right mind is going to say that N.T. Wright's uneducated? I, I dare. I mean, even Preston um, quotes him all the time in different things. So, no, by far long shot, N.T. is not uneducated. If the text that speaks of the Son of Man coming on the clouds refers to AD 70, as I have argued that in part they do, this doesn't mean that the AD 70 was the second coming, because the Son of Man texts aren't second coming texts at all. Despite the frequent misreading that way, they are about Jesus' vindication, and Jesus' vindication in his resurrection, ascension, and judgment on Jerusalem. Now, let me explain this. I like to walk around, but I'll, I'll stay here. Um, what, he is, what he goes on to say there, and this is in response, second coming. When we look at that text, Son of Man coming on clouds. Absolutely right. Coming on clouds has everything to do with judgment coming. Son of Man is a title that comes from Daniel 7, 13, 14. It was the Son of Man who was coming into the presence of God. And he was given a throne. But the language there is very specific. Let me see if I can pull him. It says that he was presented for before the Ancient of Days. He came into his presence on clouds. And so what N.T. is arguing, and after my examination of Matthew 24 and 31, well, how in the world can you sit there and say... Um, that's what everybody says is the second coming. That's the promise right there. But how do the other church fathers not believe that? What did they miss? What did I miss? Let's look at it. So if he's invoking that passage, which is not a second coming passage, but it is talking about Christ ascending into heaven and giving and becoming king. He's sitting down at the right hand of the Father. And because they killed him, he in turn is sending judgment back on them for their rejection of him. So the passage in Matthew 16, where he's before Caiaphas, he said, from this point forward, you will see me sitting at the right hand of God. And the right hand always means what? Authority. I share the authority. Yeah. And so he has the right to judge. John um, chapter 5, 26, 27, he says, it says he has self-existing. He has life within himself. And because he, has, because he is the Son of Man, he has the right to judge. So if that passage is not about the second coming, then the, is Jesus, when he quotes it, is he talking about his vindication, his ascension, his ascension into heaven and being vindicated in that way, and the promise of judgment coming? Or is he talking about his second coming? See, we would say, no, it's not about the second coming. And I'll explain why in a little bit more, why I would, I would disagree with Okay, you see that. That's, that's what I argued way back then. That's what I've been arguing and talking about. This is what I presented to Roy Runyon. He denied it. 
ignored it, but now he wants to come back and what does he want to do? Teach it. But he doesn't tell you the context whatsoever that the Son of Man coming on the clouds has nothing to do with him coming down, but everything to do with his ascension. Um, I think there's a couple more. And uh... You see, these are a carbon copy of each other. And it is the kingdom of heaven. Amen. But then again, the scripture twisters come blowing into town, kicking dust, <laughs> kicking dust, and and, and uh, calling names. It has to be a transition verse at verse thirty-six because prior to that, he's talking about those days, and then he switches by saying, "Okay, I I don't agree on any of this about switching. Of course, as I said, it is all about uh, the that coming. So I got to skip forward to eighteen. Right about here. Okay, let's go back a little bit. This this transfer transition verse theology. This this goes into the word parousia, and um, I'm going to show you from his comments why he is. I, I mean, this is a major deviation from anything kind of um, solid or biblical in any way whatsoever. He is thoroughly. Falsified. Now, pardon me while I make a slight transition here. <laughs> Pun intended. <laughs> because Open Office could not support the whole program in one in one program. Okay. All right. So we're looking at the word parousia. This word is defined. As presence, a coming, arrival, advent. But notice that it is a singular noun. Okay, let's go look up that word real quick just for the hearing impaired. Uh, I'm joking, I'm joking. Second uh, Thessalonians 2.8, it uses both words. Okay, parousia. Scroll down here. Wait a minute, you got to come up here. Yeah, you can do it. Okay, there it is. Presence, a coming. Um, it's used to be present, to arrive into a situation, probably coming, the arrival of an owner who can deal with the situation. It's a technical term with the reference to the visit of a king or some official, a royal visit. Hence, New Testament specifically of the advent of, or parousy of Christ. It is used in the East as a technical expression for the royal visit of a king or emperor. And the word literally means the being besides, thus the personal presence of somebody who is right beside you. It is used 24 times, one time of his first coming. And then Second Thessalonians, uh, let's scroll down here a little bit, if it wants to cooperate with me. Come on, processing brain. Okay. Oh, let's go back up. Second Thessalonians, keep going. There we go. Okay, the one we just read was, right, the appearance of his coming. Look in 2 Thessalonians 2.9. It is the one whose coming is in a second. It is the coming according to the living. What is, what is it talking about? Let's go there. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2.9. I didn't want that one. Let's go to this. The actual, here we go, inner layer. Who is... Coming according to the working of Satan in every power and signs and wonders, the lawless one, he, his coming is a parousia. So, in those 24 times, 16 of them refer to Christ, one refers to the lawlessness, the coming, the parousia of the lawless ones by the activity of Satan. Now, did he come invisibly or did the lawless come visibly? There you go. See that? Visibly was his presence. Absence, presence, was he there? Was the law, or, you're, or otherwise you're going to have to say that if Jesus' is coming is invisible, so was the coming of the lawless one, the activity uh, by you know the beast. He was invisible. But, of course, we know that's not true if you want to claim it was narrow. Um, oh, that was just the spirit. Yeah, no, come on. I've skewed, Kate. I've, I hate that word. You, you'll never get it. You won't ever get it. Um I'm getting ready to run out of time on my speaker. 
and I will let this play out and then you can go back to the uh, the video but the point then in in I will try to make this within the next four minutes the the word parousia the word parousia is used in two different ways and Maybe I should go on. I will go on. But for the sake of uh, the people on, on Spreaker, let's put it this way. Parousia, 16 times by Christ, once about the lawless one, and other people have come to it. In every indication, it's a technical term. I showed you the thing there. Um, a technical term meaning the personal presence of someone. So Stephenus and all these others that he'll bring up in the video, yes, he, they personally came. That's the present. But that's not how it's used in the old. And so what I'm going to end up going to do is show you how Don Preston argued for this, how it's shown up actually in uh, in uh, the record. Uh, if I was to go back, you would see that uh, on the listing of BibleHub.com, you would find parousia being used as a uh, technical term. And uh, it still shows it in both ways a technical term meaning that uh, technical term meaning that the uh, when it, Caesar would come to a place and, and it was his personal presence when he came to a city to deal with the situation that he only could they all called that the parousia of Caesar the coming of Caesar and it was always considered a very very big deal so um, you can see this in the video where it's used how many times uh, the way used and it's using Two different ways. One is the presence. First uh, Corinthians six and seven. You look at those, as opposed to Philippians two twelve. Then the presence of one coming. Hence the coming, the arrival, the advent of a person who comes. Um, and it's called. Which go on. You can read this all the way through yourself because this is on BibleHub.com. The Greek Strong's for thirty nine fifty two. It it's all there. And you just simply cannot miss it, folks. You can't miss it. And uh, uh, we're going to deal with that later on. So you guys over here on this side, on the speaker side, um, come back. I will do a second format that deals with this parasite just a little bit better and answer some things that I will already cover here, too. Um, but I don't have the means to restart. Well, maybe I can. No. Yeah. No, yeah, I can. Maybe I can do it. I can restart it and do another one um, right at the same time. So I'll just have to post it a little bit differently. Okay, thank you guys for listening over there in Spreaker, and be ready. We'll come back.